Good morning. It's good to see you here today as we come to this place to worship together and to fellowship with one another in this place. Just a few announcements that we want to remind you of. You'll see on your, your inserts in your bulletins a list of the activities and uh, some of these things coming up this week and the next couple of weeks. You'll want to take note of those things. A few things that we want to uh, add to that or to uh, highlight. First of all, tonight at 7 o'clock, the deacons will be having a uh, deacons meeting at 7. Uh, that was not included, so if you would remember that, 7 o'clock tonight, deacons meeting in the Langford Room. This coming Saturday, I want to encourage all of the youth and all of their parents to meet at the pastor's parsonage at 5 o'clock for a parent youth cookout. We'll be uh, eating together, fellowshipping, playing some volleyball, and discussing and sharing some ideas and plans for our year with our youth ministry. I hope you'll take advantage of that. The guys were asking to bring a two-liter soft drink, and all the girls should bring either a bag of cookies or a bag of chips. And we're asking that guys and girls both bring their parents. And we're asking that parents bring their youth. However, if uh, you cannot come because... Uh, uh, if your parents cannot come, or parents, if your youth are busy but you can come, please come on anyway. We will make this a parent or youth cookout, whatever the case may be. We hope to see you all Saturday afternoon at 5. Next Sunday, let me remind all of our Sunday school classes and leaders, next Sunday will be high attendance day here in our church. We're shooting for a goal of 200 or more in Sunday school next week and I would encourage everyone to contact your class members this week if you see them at the store or at work or at school this week remind them of the higher attendance day encourage them to especially this week to be in Sunday school uh, at 945 and to come and to bring a friend with them if you would contact everyone and let's reach our goal for next Sunday Next Sunday is also the beginning of our fall revival. We have been in prayer for our revival and have been preparing for that in the past several weeks. I know you'll want to continue to pray for our revival services. Pray for Reverend Stephen Earle, who will be coming to lead us in these services next Sunday through next Wednesday night. And I hope you will take advantage of these services and hope you will invite friends and neighbors and relatives to come with you and to participate fully. God is preparing to do great things in our midst, and we ask you to pray to that end. It is good to see you here today, and we want to give you a chance to turn and greet those who are around you. Let them know that you are also glad to see them here and to express God's love to them. Let's stand and greet one another this morning. pause now for a moment as we turn our hearts and our minds to God and in these quiet moments prepare ourselves to encounter God in worship.
you take your bulletins and join me in this morning's responsive reading? Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is my above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Will you turn to hymn number 206 in your hymnals and let us sing together the hymn that echoes that thought, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's stand as we sing. Father and our God, in whom we live and move and have our being, from whose bountiful hand comes every blessing of life. We come together in the house that is called by your name to offer unto you thanks for those blessings, to seek the companionship and the fellowship of your Holy Spirit as we fellowship one with another and to ask of you that our hearts and our minds may be attuned to your word, that we may permit thy spirit to speak unto our needs, whether in comfort or in forgiveness or in encouragement. And thou art all things unto us. I pray that through the music and the prayers and the listening unto you, that when we depart this place that we can truly say that it has been good to have been in the house of the Lord. We share together in spirit, we share together 
in prayer as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Picking out the, the next two hymns, I noticed a similarity in their themes. The first hymn, the refrain echoes, From sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hand he lifted me, from shades of night to plains of light, oh praise his name, he lifted me. And the second hymn, the theme pervading the hymn, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. The ideas of being raised up to a closer walk and closer fellowship with Christ is throughout both of these two hymns. And then I noticed another similarity. The same person wrote the tune to both of these hymns. Charles Gabriel, a very prolific composer, wrote many of our well-known and loved hymns. And he wrote the tunes to both of these hymns. In fact, he also wrote the words to the first hymn. And therefore, I think it fitting that we sing these two hymns back to back. The first one is 542, In Loving Kindness, Jesus Came. We'll ask that the congregation remain seated as we sing that hymn. And then as we begin the introduction for the second hymn, 484, Higher Ground. We'll ask the congregation to stand and to sing together. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanza of each of these hymns.
as we continue in preparation for our revival next week. Will you join me as we read together our scripture reading from the 51st Psalm, verses 10 and 15. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Amen.
It is a compliment to any pastor to be invited back to a former church to a help in the observance on special occasions. It is a compliment to the church of his present pastorate because it speaks of the fact of the goodness and speaks of the fact of the fellowship that he had with the former congregation and that he can go back without any problem and that the church is comforted by this very fact. The 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke is perhaps <clears throat> one of the most talked about chapters in the New Testament as it relates to the parables of Jesus. And there are three parables that are recorded in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And that is the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then there's the parable that is quote unquote called the prodigal son, which begins with the 11th verse of that chapter and which shall serve as a background of our thinking together this morning. A certain man had two sons. And the younger said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. And so he divided unto them his living. And not many days hence, the younger gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his inheritance in riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a great famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into the field for to feed swine. And he would have filled his stomach with the droppings of the husk of the, that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And he came to himself. And he said, how many hired servants in my father's house have bread enough to spare? And here I am perishing with hunger. Now this will I do. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired servants. So he arose and he came to his father. But while he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion upon him, ran, fell upon his neck, and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and, and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us celebrate. For this my son was dead is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the parable goes on and speaks about the elder son, but with him we shall leave for another time. And a certain man had two sons. And the younger said to his father, Give me my inheritance. Now the young man has been criticized because that he asked the father for his inheritance, but according to the Jewish law of inheritance, and from a very good friend of mine, Rabbi Bernstein, with whom I have had uh, many conversations of B'nai B'nai B'rith in New York, uh, that this young man probably was of the age of 30. And at the age of 30, according to the inheritance laws of the, of the Jews, he could request his inheritance and the father uh, could give it to him. You will observe that in the request that Jesus does not point out that there is any degree of argument. There is no, well, why don't you wait a little while, or uh, I don't have it all together right now. He just simply divided his living among them. Well, now, we sometimes think that he got half of what his daddy had, but that's not right. You see, also according to the Jewish law of inheritance, he only got a third 
the elder son got two-thirds. And so he may not have received as much as we uh, thought that he was going to receive, but at least he received that portion that he knew that he was going to receive, one-third of it. And so his father gave it to him. Legally, he could ask his daddy for it, and he did, and his daddy responded, but legal does not always make right. It may be legal to recognize homosexuals and lesbians, but that doesn't make it right. It may be legal or it may be lawful to live together without the benefit of marriage, but that does not make it right. It may be legal or it may be lawful not to have prayer in school and at the public gatherings of educational institutions, but that does not make it right. Divorce may be legal, but that doesn't make it right according to the teachings of the word. So legal does not always make right. And yet the young man, he was within his, his rights to do so, and so he did. And after a while, he gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Now, I don't imagine for one minute that he went into this far country uh, driving some sheep and some cattle and oxen and so forth ahead of him. I think perhaps that he converted it in, into money and he had the money in his wallet and he went on his way. And so he went into a far country and there he wasted his substance in riotous living. In my ministry, I have seen it time and time again. That young people who have left the place of their nativity to seek, shall we say, fun and enjoyment somewhere else. And in the area where I spent some 38 years as pastor, I saw it over and over and over again reaching that age that they thought to themselves somewhere between 18 and 21, I am old enough now to face the world. I don't have to listen to the uh, instruction of daddy and mama. I don't have to listen to the instruction of others. I'm sick and tired of it. I'll just take what belongs unto me and I'll make my own way in life. And then they suddenly come to the realization of the reality of life. The realization that life is not giving, that life is taking. It is not designed to be one of unending happiness. It is filled with disappointment and hurt. And all too soon they realize that the grass that looked greener on the other side is dying also. They come into an area where they think that there is employment and perhaps during those summer months, the tourist season, they were able to find a temporary employment, but then the summer passes and they find themselves in dire need Oh, they have made some friends, but they're fair-weather friends. Most of the friends that they had made were sharing in the same circumstances as they. And they began to be in want. I have had them sit across my desk, tell me stories that I had heard before, but yet from different lips. And to them I reply, well, have you called home? Don't you think, oh, no, 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 I couldn't do that. There's the phone. The call doesn't cost you anything. Some called. Some heard the good news on the other end. Yes, come on home. We forgive. Others did not. Some left with laughter. And some left in tears. They came into a far country and famine overtook them. 
There is a famine that happens to Christians as well. There is a time in which that we enjoy the companionship and the fellowship of those that are called by the name of God, the people of God. And for a while and for a time we share together in worship, in prayer, and in singing. And then for whatever reason, we began to drift away from the church and suddenly we find ourselves in the land of famine. We have left off the reading of God's word, which is the bread of life, the staff of life. We have left off that communication with him in that marvelous gift that is given unto us that is called prayer. And we have left off to that joy that comes unto us in fellowshipping one with another. We enter in to a land of famine. And then when they talk about revival, there is no excitement within us. There is nothing that stirs us within. To be a part of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Because we're living in the land of famine. There are very few justifiable reasons for not being found in the house of God on God's day. And the quickest way to get lost and to starve and to be in the land of famine is just to neglect principles and the teachings that you learned as a youth. And famine certainly will come. And he spent all. And there wasn't anything else left for him to do and so he began to, to try to find employment but where in the world is he going to find employment? There's a famine in the land and jobs are scarce. But he heard of one, and so he went to the man, and he sent him into the field for to feed his pigs. And as he fed the pigs the pods that he had together, he would have filled his own body, his own stomach, with what the pigs were eating. And no man gave unto him, because they were all in like situation. Oh, there may have been a time in his experience whenever uh, he was... A goody-goody. Perhaps he was the life of the party, but uh, the means of his happiness ran out. And he came to himself. And he said, how many hard servants in my father's house have bread enough and to spare? And here I'm starving to death. Now what am I going to do? That's the first step toward renewal. Is the recognizing of the fact that it is by our own willingness that we have drifted away from God. Now this will I do. I will get up and I will go to daddy and I will say to him, daddy I'm no longer to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I've done things that I don't want to talk about. Just make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up, and he started home. And while he was a great way off, Daddy saw him. And he recognized him. And he ran, and he fell on his neck, and he kissed him. And the son began the speech that he had rehearsed. A speech that he never got to finish, by the way. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. That's as far as he got. Then the father demonstrates the joy of forgiveness. There is nothing in all of our human makeup that denies us the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment of life 
than an unforgiving spirit. And there is no greater joy that comes into the life of an individual than to have a forgiving spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot work in an unforgiving heart. The power of the Holy Spirit cannot be demonstrated within the church with an unforgiving church. Where there is the idea that no matter what comes or no matter what goes, I'll never forgive that individual for what he or she has done to me. Consider the plight of the father and the son. The son had taken everything that his daddy had worked for that was rightfully his and wasted it in, in a manner that was depicable. And yet the father is willing to forgive. And the son is willing to accept. the original story. Many years ago, there was a teenager who left home and he ran afoul of the law. And he did things that no teenager should do at home or even away from home as far as that's concerned. And he found himself in prison. He had lost all contact with his father. He did not keep in touch with him. There came the time in prison when he had the opportunity to sit and to think and to relive his life and what he had done with it. And so he sat down one evening and he wrote a letter to his daddy. He said, Daddy, thus and so has happened to me and I am now nearing the end of my prison sentence and I'd like to come home. I would like you to forgive me for what I have done. Now, Daddy, if you will do this, I'll be on the train as it passes through town on such and such a day. Hang a sheet on the apple tree in the front yard. And when I see the sheet, then I will know that you have forgiven me and you are going to welcome me home and I'll get off. If I don't see the sheep, I'll stay on the train. At the appointed time, the young man boarded the train. He sat down by a stranger. And as they neared the town that, where that he was to get off, he told this man about his problem. The man recognized that he had a problem. And he said, Mr., when we get near the town, said, will you look and tell me if there's a sheet on the apple tree in the front yard? You can't miss it. The train goes right by. He said, sure, son, I'll do that. And so as the train neared the town, the boy could not bear to look, and so he buried his face and his hands between his knees And he knew that from the distance that they were approaching or had passed. And he said, Mr., do you see a sheet? He said, no. No. I don't see a sheet. I see sheets. Sheets hanging from every tree that there is around the house, the neighbors' homes. Son, get up, get off. Your father forgives and welcomes you home. I've wasted many a precious year. Now I'm coming home. Well, the world has asked itself the question, is there forgiveness for me? Is there forgiveness for me? Is there a joy that can come into my heart and into my life? 
Well, the word tells us that there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repenteth and over ninety and nine just persons that need no repentance, the joy of forgiveness. How do we know that there is forgiveness offered us? Oh, we don't have to look out the train window to see. We're not looking for the sheep, but what we are looking for is the sign that God gave unto the, all the world. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved, thus saith the Lord. And he advertises that forgiveness in his Son upon the cross of Calvary. God says through that act, I guarantee that if you confess your sins unto me, and you open your heart and you say to my son, come in, I'll forgive your sin. And God rejoices at the opportunity to forgive. The recipient of that forgiveness rejoices also for it fills one's heart with laughter and with song and with certainty. We confess our sins to God. We never get through telling God all of our sins. He hears enough. And he says, I forgive. And oh, the joy that comes to our heart. Into our life. And certainly the theme of our revival that begins next Sunday morning is if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven I will forgive their sin. I'll not only heal their land I'll heal that individual that comes unto me. Have you known and do you know the joy of forgiveness? If not, in this moment as we bow our heads and we remember those that are lost they may or may not be in this congregation this morning but we would remember them that they may come to know the joy of forgiveness if you would open your heart and let Jesus come in and you would come this morning and tell us about it that we might rejoice with you that the angels might rejoice with you or perhaps your membership is somewhere else. You're attending this church. You'd like to become a part of its fellowship. We would invite you to come. <clears throat> and our hymn of invitation. I've wandered far away from God. But now I'm coming home. Won't you come this morning? Won't you come? Good morning. This is Jeff Roberts, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Middlesboro, Kentucky. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today through our Sunday morning broadcast. We hope each week that you are blessed by God, encouraged in the faith, and challenged to live your life with a deeper commitment to and a relationship with God through God's Son, Jesus Christ. For nearly 20 years, our morning worship service has been broadcast as an outreach ministry to our city. And we are glad to provide this ministry to you. However, we at First Baptist do not believe that there is a substitute for being with God's people in God's house for worship. So if you are new in our city, or if you currently do not attend one of our other wonderful churches in the Middlesboro area, we invite you to worship with us in person next week. Our Sunday school begins at 945, and there you will find Bible study and fellowship for all ages. 
It is followed by our morning worship service at 11 a.m. First Baptist Church is located at 23rd and Cumberland in downtown Middlesboro. If we can minister to you or if you would like more information concerning our many exciting ministries at First Baptist, feel free to write us or call us at our church office during our regular office hours. Until next week, it is our prayer that you might know the transforming love of God and the peace that comes through relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. morning for your very kind attention. Please remember our pastor as he returns to us tonight that he may further engage in the activities of the day. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the moments that we've been privileged to spend in the house that is called by thy name. We thank you for the hymns that have touched our heart and have uplifted our spirit. We thank you for the fellowship and we thank you for the joy in that fellowship. And we thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the anticipation of the coming revival. That protection upon our pastor as he travels back to us. And unto us as we depart this place. May the joy of your fellowship, the oneness of your spirit, and the power of his presence be always with us, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist this morning. It's good to see you here on this beautiful day as we begin our time of worship and the time of revival together. Let me give you just a few announcements. Of course, the thing going on this week at church is our revival. And tonight we will have services at 7 and we'll have services each night at 7 through Wednesday evening. Wednesday evening we will begin at 5.30 with a fellowship meal. It is a potluck meal, so we hope that everybody will bring a dish and join us for a time of fellowship at 5.30. And then we'll come up to the sanctuary after that and have our time of worship. Let me mention one other item which will be occurring next Sunday night. We're going to be having the BSU drama team from the University of Tennessee. This is a wonderful group of young people who present the gospel in a very creative way. And they're going to be in the chapel at 6 o'clock. And it's a wonderful time for everyone in the family as far as worship is concerned. And so we hope that you'll plan to be here next Sunday night also at 6 o'clock to see this drama team. We're glad that you're here this morning as we begin our revival this week. Especially glad to have you if you're one of our guests. If you're visiting with us, we hope that you'll take the time to fill out a visitor's card that you find in the pew rack in front of you and to place in the offering plate a little later in the service so that we can have a record of your time with us this morning. We want to give you a chance to greet one another and to greet our guests. So we're going to stand and greet one another, and then we're going to sing our revival theme song, which Mark Hill has written, Make Me New, Lord. Let's stand and greet one another. that theme song twice through. You'll find the text printed there in your bulletin. Will you join us as we sing, Make Me New, Lord. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 215 and would invite you to follow along the choir as they sing Majesty, uh, this morning's call to worship. As the choir sings and as you follow along and perhaps even hum along or sing along, I invite you to quiet your hearts and to still your minds as we prepare to worship, prepare to hear God speak to us this morning.
stand as we sing our hymn of praise, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Almighty God, you are the cause for our celebration, our reason for worship, our strength for the present, and our hope for the future. But sometimes, O oh Lord, you are the disturber of our souls. Trouble the waters deep within us that we may be healed, healed of old ways of thinking, healed of old ways of seeing our world, healed of old ways of living. For we are your children, O oh God, and we are called to be new creations. In the name of Christ, our Lord, we pray as you taught us. Our Father, we art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory forever. Our next hymn this morning is a beautiful, beautiful text and a tune that is at least somewhat familiar to all of us. I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us from the accursed load. We sing this hymn of confession as we continue to prepare for God to revive this church and to revive us to a closer walk with God. Hymn number 272, I Lay My Sins on Jesus.
This week, our theme for the week is found in 2 Chronicles 7.14. And we will be reading this passage together each evening as we prepare our time for worship. This is the scripture from which Reverend Earl will be preaching each service. So if you will turn in your bulletin with me and let us read this scripture together. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We sing a hymn medley that reminds us of the mission of this church and every church. We are called to be God's people, and to be God's servants, and to be God's prophets. Lord, thy church on earth is seeking thy renewal from above. And the final hymn, stir your church, O God our Father, move throughout its life today. Cultivate a sense of mission in our hearts and minds, we pray. Help us to renew commitment to a way of ministry which interprets for our culture how your truth can make us free. Beginning with hymn number 390, let's stand together as we sing.
pray together. God, as we come on this day and we seek new beginnings with you, new beginnings as individuals and as a church and in a community, we come and we give thanksgiving for all that you have blessed us with. We come this day knowing that all that we have belongs to you, and we offer these gifts, these offerings, these tithes to you as a symbol of our love for you, and we pray today that you would bless them and use them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our revival speaker for this week. Many of you know him better than I do, and some of you may know things he wish you didn't know. I don't know. When I was a college student at the University of Tennessee, uh, the Baptist student union director there told me that South Knoxville Baptist Church was looking for a youth minister part-time, and so I said I was interested, and I met with Reverend Stephen Earle for the first time, and uh, he hired me and then left. In fact, the day I joined, he resigned. <laughs> we were only able to work with each other for just a month or so, but we had a wonderful experience, and I respected him very much at that time. When I came to Middlesboro, I thought about Stephen and having him come to be our revival speaker. Stephen, of course, is a native of Middlesboro and a graduate of Cumberland College and Southern Baptist Seminary. He's pastored several churches. Today he pastors the First Baptist Church of Ponca City, Oklahoma. And we are glad to have him with us this week. I think you will not be disappointed by attending and hearing what Stephen has to say. So after the choir has their anthem, we want to welcome Reverend Stephen Earle home and to this pulpit.
the last official act at South Knoxville Baptist Church to call Jeff Roberts as the uh, Minister of Youth. Received quite a bit of commendation, by the way. Uh, several people said you and Robin, Robin particularly, were a real bright spot during the church and in those months. Uh, and I'm glad you're here at First Baptist Middlesboro. Haven't you found him to be a bright spot in your church as he was at South Knoxville? Good job. I am deeply honored to be your guest this four days in revival effort and have a deep concern about revival in our land. We'll be talking about that concern as we look at 2 Chronicles 7.14 every night. While I grew up here in Middlesboro, and as most of you know, was not a member at First Baptist Church, but was greatly influenced by this congregation, and particularly by ministers in this congregation. Uh, Truett Miller was, for me, a model of what a pastor ought to be. Have I got this on or not? Huh? Is that on or not? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Is it working? Yeah. It's working. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you can hear me or not. I want you to hear what I have to say. Uh, Truett Miller was a model for me of what a minister should be. And uh, Bill Mackey encouraged me on several occasions as I was thinking about the possibility of profession ministry. And then Ron Rich's friendship, which goes even to today. Ron and I talk periodically even to this day. Uh, have been real encouragement to me over the years. And this church, while you didn't know it, had a tremendous impact as I grew up and prepared for ministry and even as I have been involved in ministry. Second Chronicles 7.14 is one of those watershed verses that appear along in Scripture. And there's more in it than we'll be able to look at over the next several nights. But I hope that you will memorize the verse be familiar with it as we talk about it together. Today we talk about beginning with the end. Stephen Covey has written a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you haven't read it, it's well worthwhile. But Covey studied people who seem to be effective or extremely effective in their various fields and identified seven habits of those individuals believing that any person who wanted to be effective in his or her field could adopt those habits into his or her life and become effective in whatever they did. Habit number two, according to Covey, is beginning with the end in mind. When it comes to revival effort, that's what I would like for us to do. To think about the last phrase of 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says, to heal their land. God said, I will heal their land. And the question comes to mind, does the land need to be healed? This verse of scripture is clothed in the context of temple dedication. Solomon, third king of Israel, dedicated a gorgeous temple. No doubt he lay down in the evening satisfied with how it had gone. God had blessed him in many ways. He was the wealthiest, most influential king in Israel's history. The dedication service had been spectacular. And as he lay on his bed reflecting over the temple, its purpose, their representing their commitment to God, their worship, desire to follow and serve the Lord, and he thought about all the sacrifices they had made and had some sense of satisfaction, God said to Solomon, the time will come when my people will drift away. The time will come when they will no longer acknowledge me as God. The time will come when their hearts will grow cold and stiff. And when that happens, pestilence will invade the land. Enemies will overrun their boundaries. The people will be crushed. Disaster will come. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. If we are going to experience revival in First Baptist Church, Middlesboro, Kentucky or First Baptist Church, Ponca City, Oklahoma, 
or in Middlesboro or Ponca City or anywhere else, I think there are two truths that we must agree upon. And the first is simply this. We desperately need revival. My concern for revival goes beyond my church or yours. I look at the route a nation has taken in my short lifetime and see that we are headed for destruction unless we make an about face somewhere along the way. Are you aware that two-thirds of all Christians, 1.8 billion people who say they know Jesus Christ in a personal way, two-thirds of those individuals live in the southern hemisphere? We think the United States is the bastion of Christianity. It is not. Sociologists are almost in unanimous agreement in what they term this country is in the post Christian era. And we are receiving on the soil of this country every month missionaries, Christian missionaries from South America and from South Africa and from other continents in the the southern hemisphere because they see us as growing more and more pagan every day. It's true. A few years ago, Merrill Haggard, I'm not a country music fan, by the way. I I don't think that's good or bad. I'm just not. But Merle Haggard sang a song and the lyrics went something like this. Are we headed downhill like a snowball? Are we rolling downhill like a snowball headed for hell? With no kind of chance for the flag or the liberty bell? And the answer is yes. Yes. Illustrations abound. Michael Barone says, We are stumbling toward dystopia, the opposite of utopia where living conditions are dreadful at best. In 1965, 26% of all births in black families were to unwed mothers, 26%. Senator Senator, uh, Monaghan said this signals the, the end of the black family in America. Today, that figure is 68%. Think of it. 68% of all children born in black families is to an unwed mother. At present time, 22% of all white births are to unwed mothers. It is predicted that before the 90s is over, that figure will reach 26%. And if so, if so, this country will begin to experience the kind of violence that we read about in Latin America. Already today, we experience 11 murders per per 100,000 people of this population in one year's time. Tragic. It's not my habit to read in the pulpit. Uh, I'll try to read well so you won't be bored. But uh, there's several things I want to share with you. Uh, Reading from a speech, Morton B. Zuckerman, who is the editor-in-chief of U.S. News and World Report, wrote, America is outraged by crime. Horror story follows horror story, east to west, north to south. In California, a sweet child is kidnapped from her own bedroom and murdered. In New York, a pregnant girl is shot in the stomach. Another gunman runs amok, slaying passengers on the Long Island Railway. And these are but a few of the recent bloodstains on the fabric of daily gunplay, rape, murder, mugging, the like of which is not seen anywhere else in the civilized world. An estimated 34 million crimes a year are committed in this country of 260 million people. That means that more than 80% of us can expect to be the victim of a crime at least once in our lifetime. And the cost? Approximately $674 billion a year of crimes in the United States. Benjamin Alexander is the president of Drew, Drew Dawn Enterprises. He delivered a speech at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, and this is what he said. Time seems to have improved on everything in America except its people. 
The French statesman Canot said, America is the only nation in history which has gone directly from barbarianism to degeneration without the usual intervention of civilization. When the Goth people overran the walls of Rome, it was not that the Roman walls were too low, but the Roman people were too low. Low from the sensual lifestyle of Pompeii, the sexual orgies on the lake Trasmino, and the perversions of the Roman people. They had a way of life in which any deviant act was acceptable. Rome was defeated because its people were once very disciplined like our American people, became moral tramps. Rome rotted from within. It was not overwhelmed from without. People of the United States are increasingly swayed under the influence of abnormal behavior of some. We are moving from grace to disgrace. That's a, not a preacher talking. That's a professor. In one year alone, the average child sees, in one year, average child sees 15,000 sexual acts on TV. Think of it. By the time a child reaches high school, they have witnessed 33,000 murders on TV and 200,000 acts of violence. Barone says television is desensitizing an entire generation of children to killing, violence, promiscuous sex, and profanity. One more. John Howard, who's a counselor at the Rockford Institute, delivered a speech entitled, Whatever Happened to Civilization? He said, the time has come, I believe, for Americans to indulge in a little panic. Things are not going well. The glue which used to hold our free society together has lost its sticking power. The fabric has been shredded. Dishonesty, corruption, vandalism, violence, crime, deceit, and maliciousness have eaten into the aspects of everyday, everyday American reality. 24,703 Americans were murdered in 1991. During that same year, there were 1,900,000 violent crimes. So many weapons are being bought and brought to school by teenagers that in 50 cities, every student entering a classroom has to walk through a metal detector. He continues, any thoughtful person will recognize that it is not possible for the society to survive more crime, more cruelty, and more dishonesty every year. In 1960, not too long ago, there were 243,000 children living in America with a never married parent. By 1990, that figure was an eye popping 5,000,000, a 20 fold hike. And such children are three times as likely as those living with both parents to flunk a grade in school, three and a half times more apt to be arrested, and six times more liable to become unmarried parents themselves. He said, my guess is that if America is to avoid being overwhelmed by crime, corruption, viciousness, and self-indulgence, the rescue will be made by small groups and private initiatives working through neighborhoods, churches, school boards, public libraries to retrieve America's forgotten ideals and to resurrect the moral standards of a decent and dignified society. Well, there's no reason to go on. But we could indeed list item after item after item from any newspaper, radio news broadcast, TV broadcast, or any news magazine to accentuate the point that our country is headed in the wrong direction. We are headed for trouble unless something is drastically done. And the only way that we will ever experience revival in our churches and in our communities yea, throughout the land, is when we come to grips with what's really happening in this country. And it's not just preachers who are concerned about it. Everywhere you turn and read in news magazines, sociologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, historians are all concerned that America has reached its peak somewhere around the mid-60s and has been headed downhill ever since and will not get any better. We desperately need revival. 
And the second truth we should agree on is this. Our only hope of revival is in the Lord. Reformation is not going to do it. We can hope to be reformed, to declare to be better, but reformation will not work. It will take genuine revival that comes from God. If you read this text in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, this is what it says. I will heal their land. Not they, because it's out of their power. And we have already proven, as ancient Israel did, it's out of their power. Ancient Israel was helpless to improve their situation. And in America, we find ourselves helpless to make things better. We've already proven that a welfare system will not make it better. We have an elaborate one. We have already proven that electing more government officials and bigger government will not make it better. We have already proven that education cannot help even though our schools need to be reformed. We have discovered that even if we get health care, it will not ease the pain of our country. That so far, there has nothing we have tried worked, and the reason is because we're trying the wrong thing. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, I, that is God, Yahweh, ruler, the God of Israel, I will heal their land. One of the things that's interesting to me is to note the way healing takes place. Healing always follows forgiveness. Look at this in the life of Jesus. He forgives their sins and heals their diseases. And forgiveness follows seeking the Lord. Those who humbly, prayerfully turn to Him, realizing that He is their only hope, that for God to act in our behalf is our only hope. And repentance and forgiveness and healing. I'm convinced, as was the late Vance Havner, that our only hope of survival is revival. You might say, well, Pastor, why is our country in such shape? Our country's like it is and in the trouble it's in because our states are in the shape they're in. Have you looked at what's happening in your state recently? As I watch what's happening in mine? The reason our states are in the trouble they're in is because our cities are in the shape they're in. Look at what goes on in the cities around this country. Our cities are in the shape they're in because our communities are falling apart. And our communities are in the condition they're in because our churches have lost touch with the communities. And our churches are in trouble because our families are in trouble. And our families are in trouble because we as individuals have drifted away from God and no longer are concerned about what He thinks. And revival comes about in the opposite way. Revival seldom come, if ever, in a mass movement of some sort. Most revivals are rooted in the acts of one or two individuals and to watch those individuals spread their commitment and share it with their families. And it moves into their churches and into their communities and into their cities and into their states and into their countries. Revival rests on our shoulders. It would be a grave mistake for us to leave here this morning and say, oh, it is terrible. The country's terrible, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, there is something we can do about it. I see, revival begins in the hearts of people like me and like you. It's when we turn our lives over to Christ and say, Lord, here am I. And when I take that commitment to my family and to my neighborhood, to my school, into my community. That's where revival begins. Beginning with the end in mind. Do you see the goal somewhere out there in the future of a great reformation in the United States of America? Can you see it? And may God, may we allow God 
to begin the revival in our hearts today. It basically comes down to the individual decisions. What will your decision be this morning? Stand with me, please, for the invitation. We're singing hymn 294, 294. In just a moment, we will sing, and I want to offer the invitation for those here who would say, I've never made a decision of faith. I've never made a personal commitment to Christ as my Savior. I can't experience revival because I don't have eternal life in me to begin with. And you'd like to trust Christ, I would encourage you to come. I offer the invitation for those here who would say, somewhere in my life I made a personal commitment to Christ. But I've drifted away from that. Haven't lived it out in the context of my life haven't served him where I live and I want to renew my commitment and my vow. I want my life to count. If there's going to be a revival, I want to be in on it and I want to rededicate my life. You come. There may be others here who are not members of First Baptist Church and yet you would like to be part of a church that's serious about the Lord, serious about godly living, serious about reaching a community, serious about bringing about change. And you would invest your life in the fellowship of believers here. If it's to trust Christ as your Savior, make a recommitment of your faith, or to become a member of this church, you come as we sing and meet your pastor here in the front, will you? Good morning. This is Jeff Roberts, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Middlesboro, Kentucky. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today through our Sunday morning broadcast. We hope each week that you are blessed by God, encouraged in the faith, and challenged to live your life with a deeper commitment to and a relationship with God through God's Son, Jesus Christ. For nearly 20 years, our morning worship service has been broadcast as an outreach ministry to our city, and we are glad to provide this ministry to you. However, we at First Baptist do not believe that there is a substitute for being with God's people in God's house for worship. So if you are new in our city, or if you currently do not attend one of our other wonderful churches in the Middlesboro area, we invite you to worship with us in person next week. Our Sunday school begins at 945, and there you will find Bible study and fellowship for all ages. It is followed by our morning worship service at 11 a.m. First Baptist Church is located at 23rd and Cumberland in downtown Middlesboro. If we can minister to you or if you would like more information concerning our many exciting ministries at First Baptist, feel free to write us or call us at our church office during our regular office hours. Until next week, it is our prayer that you might know the transforming love of God and the peace that comes through relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. You come at all because I desperately believe that we need revival. And it begins in services like this and among people like we are. But in order for any such effort to start, those of us who know him must be willing to say yes. You see, Jesus said yes to the cross for us. Yes to the tomb for us. And I would urge you to say yes to him today. We'll sing another stanza of the invitation. I'll turn the service over to your pastor. If you would like to come, to trust Christ. Maybe you don't know how. Someone here will be glad to help you. If you would like to come and, and recommit your life, or if you'd like to join this great church, you come as we sing this next stanza, will you?
these have come today to say they want to rededicate their lives, to say that they can make a difference when they give their life fully to Christ. I hope you'll pray for these, and I know others today have made that same commitment. And I hope you'll be back tonight and every night this week as we seek together revival from the Lord. I'm going to ask Stephen if he'll stand here at the front with me and give you a chance to greet him this morning. And as we leave, let us sing our theme for revival, Make Me New, Lord.